Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for uh, joining uh, me this morning uh, for our uh, ETSU student executive briefing. Uh, before I do that, though, I want to remind everyone that uh, if you would, uh, the team captains from the five companies that you are doing your team research projects on, if, if you would email me uh, so I know who to send the peer review to, and then I look for you to complete that and put that along with your team's research project in the Dropbox uh, for next Tuesday. So if you haven't done that already, please uh, decide who that captain is and, uh, and go ahead and, uh, and let me know so I can do that. Also, as we talked about last time, be prepared uh, for a little three to five minute uh, briefing uh, for the class about your recommendations going forward for your for your companies. So, okay, let's uh, let's go ahead and uh, and start our student executive briefing. And I appreciate again you joining in for that this morning. I wish you all had the opportunity to meet my mom and dad. My dad was all about lessons learned. He didn't have much time for failure. Uh, he was all about moving forward in his life. You see, I grew up in a house where my father only had a fifth grade education. Both his parents died from tuberculosis when he was six years old. As a decorated survivor of the landing on Omaha Beach and the Battle of the Bulge in World War II, dad had returned to the United States, having seen Europe through the eyes of war and he was ready to move forward with his life. Mom was a new high school graduate, and when dad returned from the war, they built a life and a business and a family together. They knew the value of hard work and education, and they went to great extremes to ensure their kids received a quality education. It was my parents, many nights of prayer and coaching and dreaming that gave me an educational compass point for my life. Their lifelong passion for learning was realized in their children. You know, as long as I can remember, I wanted to be an engineer. Uh, I was heavily influenced, I'm sure, by the space race of the 60s and the advent of NASA. That coupled with the fact that I always wanted to know how things work, my parents told me as a child, that my toys didn't last very long, of course, because I tore them apart to see how they worked, how, how they were assembled. Well, my dream came true when I received a Bachelor of Science in Chemical Engineering from the University of Tennessee, but that was merely the start of my life's journey. You know, as an engineer, as I've told you all in class many times, we love numbers, uh, we love accuracy, and so, uh, my career at Eastman Chemical Company uh, was, uh, can be defined by numbers. I was fortunate enough to work for Eastman for 37 years. During that time, I had 26 different jobs that spanned 12 countries across four continents. I had 33 bosses, some of which were very good, and most importantly, I had one wife, my wife, Donna. You know, at the time, I thought asking Donna to marry me was a big accomplishment, when in fact, convincing her to stay married to me for 40 years was an even bigger one. Donna and I are certainly the most fortunate people on planet Earth. Having been blessed with two wonderful daughters, a son-in-laws that we prayed for since the time our girls were born, and two beautiful granddaughters, Lily and Magnolia. We call her Maggie. They're the absolute obsessions of our lives. You know, I find it hard to admit sometimes that it's been over three decades since I was an MBA student at ETSU in Dr. Gene and Ed Stead's classrooms. In my lifetime, I've seen technology go from a slide rule to mega data systems, ERP systems, and portals that allowed me to work anywhere in the world with just an iPhone or an iPad. Things have really changed in my lifetime. 
that was made very clear to me the other day when our granddaughter Lily saw an old phone with a cord coming out of it and she asked me what that cord was for. And as we talk today, you all have already accomplished a tremendous amount on your life's journey. Of course, you couldn't have done it by yourself. None of us really can. Uh, we're the product of our parents and our teachers and our mentors and our coaches and our friends. And they deserve a great deal of thanks for helping us along our way. Since most of you here today are at the start of your career, I wanted to offer some thoughts about how you can make that journey a success. How you can turn the potential that you've already demonstrated into accomplishments that could make the whole world set up and take notice. And I call these Jim's top 10 secrets to success. So I'm gonna share my screen with you now and pull those up. And I've got these uh, in, in an order from 10 to one. So we'll start with number 10. Ask questions, spend time learning the business and the culture. Live today like you're going to die tomorrow and learn today like you're gonna live forever. Mahatma Gandhi said those words and, and they've been words that I've taken to heart across my 40 years of my career. You know, I started my career, my very first day was uh, a maintenance helper at Eastman. Now a maintenance helper is just a fancy name for a guy that carries the toolbox for the mechanic. And on my first day on the job, I learned three very important lessons. The first was we're gonna do things safely. The second is, However long it takes, we're going to make sure that we do a quality job because at the end of the day, that quality will be what people remember. And then finally, when we're done, we're going to take our tools and we're going to clean them and we're going to put them back in the toolbox so they'll be in the right place and in pristine condition so that we can use them the next day. So three pretty good lessons for the first day. When you think, be safe, do a quality job, and take care of your assets. You know, over the years, I've hired thousands of people across the world for Eastman. And during that first year, like most companies and employees on a probationary period, and at the end of that period, I would always invite the employee into my office and have a talk. It was a time for them to decide, is this the right move for them to stay with Eastman going forward? And Quite frankly, it was a, the, move, the, the move for Eastman to decide whether they wanted the employee to continue going forward. During that conversation, I would always ask the employee, if you had to spend the whole year and do it all over again, what would you do differently? And for the most part, they would say, I would wanna ask more questions. I would wanna spend time learning because there's just so much to learn. And, and they, they didn't feel like they had, they had finished, and they certainly hadn't. So it's important to continue asking questions, to keep learning. You're the most important asset that any business or firm has. You're one of the few assets that actually appreciate over time rather than depreciate. And that rate of appreciation depends on your ability and desire to continue learning. Secret number nine, when you're building a vision and a culture that lasts, you need to hire missionaries and not crusaders. You know, what makes organizations work, what differentiates teams are not people who are out for number one at the expense of others, but people who believe first and foremost in the team and the cause. I spent years trying to convince people with data and models and spreadsheets to make this change or take that road. It took many years before I realized that I needed to convince folks, not just in their heads, but in their hearts, if an idea or project was truly going to be successful. 
they needed to believe in the case for change. They needed to believe that the need was true. And once they did, they did amazing things. They moved mountains and were wildly successful because they believed, not in themselves, but in the cause. Number eight, don't drink your own bath water. Sometimes you're just blessed. That's my cute way of saying, beware of arrogance. You know, in the 90s and the early 2000s, uh, there were some pretty major scandals at Enron and WorldCom and Tyco. And these companies started off, these leaders started off with some real insights. They started to believe, however, that they were the smartest people in the room. They believed their own press clippings. My advice to you is never think too much of yourself. The fact is that sometimes you're just in the right place at the right time. And you have to position yourself when you have that opportunity to make a difference. Make a difference in a life, in an organization, or your community. You know, as a young engineer, I had the opportunity to be part of Eastman Chemical's journey to producing chemicals from coal. Eastman was the first company to use gasification technology to produce feedstocks that fed their acetyl streams and, and gave them a legacy of competition in the marketplace versus uh, oil-based competitors. Today, we call that clean coal technology. And it was, it was needle moving. What a learning experience I had. Not because I was the smartest guy in the room, but because I was there at the right place at the right time and took advantage of it. Secret number seven, enough is as good as a feast. Well, this one comes from that great business expert and management guru, Mary Poppins. It means simply that you should be satisfied in life when you have enough. A moment ago, I mentioned these business scandals. How many lives have been ruined and families destroyed? in the pursuit of more and more riches, more and more power. The tale of Enron is a story of human weakness, a hubris and greed and rampant self-delusion and ambition run amok, a grand experiment that is in a deregulated world of a business model that didn't work and the smartest people who believe their next gamble would cover their last. At the bottom, it was really people who couldn't admit they were wrong. I want you to remember this. Sometimes it's the small things in life that are the most valuable. Ask any parent as they look into the eyes of a newborn baby or see their child succeed, if they trade that moment for any amount of money. Secret number six, it's not about lessons learned, it's about lessons applied. My dad had a less elegant, but just as effective way of saying it when he would say to me, son, don't be stupid on purpose. It's okay to make a mistake if you don't know any better, but when you do know better, you have to be smart. You have to learn from that mistake. Years ago, I was traveling from Munich to Berlin, Germany, to do some engineering and equipment inspections. And I asked my dad if he would like to go to Europe with me. He said, son, I landed on Omaha Beach on D-Day. I walked from France to Czechoslovakia. I've seen all of Europe I want to see. You see, he was done with that part of his life, that part of his journey. He was ready to move on. In most organizations, we learn new lessons, of course. However, much of the time we succeed when we figure out how to apply what my dad called learnings in the right way. That requires a certain amount of discipline. Always examine the root cause and the existing processes. Postmortems really should be a way of life for any organization and any individual. Whether you succeeded or you failed, there's always a lot to learn from that and to apply it. Secret number five, be patient. Hang around success long enough and good things are going to happen. 
you know, that's probably the hardest thing for people sometimes, isn't it, to be patient, especially when you're young and smart and ambitious like each of you. My advice is to enjoy the journey. When success comes to you, and it will, celebrate it. However, when trouble comes, follow the words of Martin Luther King Jr. The ultimate measure of a man or a woman is not where they stand in moments of comfort and convenience, but where they stand at times of challenge and controversy. Secret number four, take on the hard job. Skate to where the puck will be. Well, skate to where the puck will be is a quote from another famous business expert. This one's name is Gordy Howe. Actually, he was a famous hockey player back in the day, a, a very prolific scorer. At the time, he was called Mr. Hockey. One day, somebody asked Gordy how he managed to score so many goals, and he said to him, I don't wait for someone to pass the puck to me. Instead, I skate to where the puck is going to be. That's some pretty good advice from Gordy. You should be looking ahead looking up and over, and not just at the obstacle that's in front of you. More importantly, you should be taking on the hardest job. You see, anybody can do an easy job. When you do, you really don't get any credit for it because it was easy. But now the hard job, that's where you learn the most. That's the job you might be nervous about, scared about. It's the one that you can't even imagine saying yes to, and yet it will the one, it is the one that will differentiate you from the crowd. Those are the jobs that will help you succeed the most. So when you're faced with a difficult decision to take on a hard job, to make a move, to embrace the challenge that presents itself to you, I want you to stop and give yourself the opportunity to think of all the reasons why you should say yes. And don't just be satisfied with all the reasons why it's safer to say no. Stephen Johnson is an author of a book called Farsighted, How We Make the Decisions That Matter the Most. And he said, once you've identified your alternatives, your scenarios, as we've talked about scenario planning and strategic management, he said, you should do some storytelling. Storytelling is something that we do instinctively, isn't it? Anytime we're contemplating making a big decision, we go over it in our minds. But in this case, I want you to be overt. I want you to write them down. I want you to imagine three different future environments, three different scenarios for your, for your decision making. One is where things get better. They're wildly successful. One is where things crash and burn. They're absolutely the worst. And then one where things just get weird, that you don't really have an understanding of which way up or down is. These scenarios will help you to think proactively rather than just to react with emotion or the pressures of the day to make that decision. And one final thought about decision making. I've talked to you a lot about Mark Twain over this semester, and I've got one more quote from him that I wanted to share. Mark Twain said that 20 years from now, you're gonna be more disappointed by the things that you didn't do than by the ones you did. Number three, build a great team and share the credit. You know, whatever you accomplish by yourself, can be multiplied many times over by working together as a part of a team. That's the reason your team research project is so important because it gives you the opportunity to delegate and to decision make and to look together, produce something as a team, which in many cases will be far greater than anything that any one individual could do. I want you to build great teams. More importantly, I want you to be a great team player. When you do win, share the credit. There's plenty of credit to go around. Now, you know, we're at a time when we can't uh, play baseball, and I miss that sport. 
In fact, I've been watching some games from decades earlier just to kind of get my fix while we can't play uh, team sports. And I've shared this story with you before, but I think it, it, it it's, uh, bears repeating. One of my favorite teams when I was a kid was uh, the Los Angeles Dodgers. And Tommy Lasorda was the manager of the Dodgers. And during his career at the helm of the Dodgers, he won eight division titles, four National League pennants, two World Series championships, and late in his career was inducted into the National Baseball Hall of Fame. So Tommy Lasorda knew a thing or two about what it takes to win, what makes a good team player, most importantly, what makes a good team. He said there's three kinds of ball players. There's those that make it happen, there's those that watch it happen, and there's those that wonder what happened. So today I'm asking you what kind of player or leader are you going to be? Are you going to be one that makes it happen in your career, for your university, for your community, for your family? I hope so. Secret number two, and you've heard me harp on this throughout the semester, but that's one reason it's so important to your success. Never ever compromise your integrity. It is so hard won and so easily given away. The news is full of persons daily that have compromised their integrity and thrown away years of experience and contributions and accomplishments, all for what's perceived to be a very short-term gain, a small win, or even a pleasure. So you shouldn't fall into that trap. Remember that the first requirement of a leader at any level is integrity and striving to live a life above reproach. As a leader, unfortunately, you're under a microscope. You, you can't get away from that. So you should work tirelessly to be worth the respect and the deserving of a good reputation. Do what's right because it's right. Be about the spirit of the law and not just the letter of the law. And if you falter, and you will, you're gonna make mistakes. But when you do, be honest. Take responsibility for your mistakes. Don't participate in the blame game. And finally, and you guys all got this right on the exam three, so I know you know what it is. The number one secret to success is faith and family are the most important things. So as you've heard, when it came to this one, I have indeed been very fortunate. I've been blessed over the years with uh, family, lots of mentors, counselors, and the truest of friends. And they've shown me every day that true happiness is not embodied in how much we have, what you personally have accomplished, what the title of the job is, or the letters at the end of your name. But it's, it's about how much you give away. Their servant hearts, to me, have been the truest of inspirations. So my question for you today is, who will you invest your time and your talent and your resources to make a difference on your life's journey? Let me close by sharing a quote from Thomas Wolfe. Wolfe is a famous author and playwright that grew up in Asheville, North Carolina, just across the mountains here from us. You might be familiar with one of his most famous works. It's called Look Homeward Angel. In the play, the main character says about life, if you really want to know about life, really know about it, you have to reach out, touch it, you have to rub up against it. You can't know about life from the couch. You can't know about life from the bench. You have to be in the game. So I want you to always give yourself fully to the work, to the work of your faith. Because well, that's truly not a labor in vain. Instead, it's one that has an eternal return. It's not finished until it's finished well. 
So I want to thank everybody for letting me spend a little bit of your morning here and early afternoon. And uh, I appreciate the opportunity that you've given me to learn together with you this semester. It truly has been a gift. I'm going to end with a picture. I told you they were the obsession of my life. So here's my granddaughters, Lily on the left and Maggie on the right. Now Maggie loves to spend her day in what she calls her, her cozy pajamas. You know, in today's world of social distancing and Zoom meetings and being at home, I'm sure we've conducted a lot of things in our cozy pajamas. But I just wanted to share these with you because this is what is important to me. This is why I do what I do. This is why that I've spent the time to learn with you this semester. This is the gift of learning and reading that I want to give to my granddaughters, to you, to the world. And if I do that, well, I will have finished well. Folks, thank you for, uh, for being here today. I appreciate you joining in. Uh, please remember uh, to send me an email if you will, so I'll know who the team captain is for your for your company uh, projects. And I know you're going to be busy this weekend, and I wish you the best, and I look forward to seeing you on Tuesday. Have a great day. Bye-bye.